Welcome to the uh, final uh, Global Awareness Lecture Program of uh, this year, of this, cal of this calendar and school year. Um, my name is Gary Prevo. I'm the director of the Global Awareness Lecture Series. Um, but I'm not going to do the introduction tonight. Um, that will be done by my colleague, Manju Parikh. And I just want to say a couple of words in introducing Manju. Um, we started this Global Awareness Lecture Series in 1982, which is 33 years ago. And um, Manju came on board four years later. So she's been with me on this project. You can do the math for um, almost 30 years. And this program of lectures, we've brought six to eight lectures to, lectures to campus all of those years on many different topics. And this has been a collaboration between myself and Manju, who has often found um, through her contacts and work um, some very interesting people to, to bring to campus. And this is her final Global Awareness Lecture Program. Um, and she has uh, found a very, very good speaker for us tonight. So Manju, um, thank you for all of the work and help that you've given to this, uh, to this program over all these years. And uh, if you'll come up and please introduce tonight's speaker. Thank you, Gary. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our esteemed guest and speaker this evening. Judge John Tunheim has served 20 years as a US District Court Judge in Minnesota. He is from Thief River Falls and raised in New Paltin, Minnesota. He graduated from Concordia College and served as a staff member for Senator Hubert Humphrey before earning a law degree from University of Minnesota. We have invited Judge Dunheim to speak at this Global Awareness Lecture event because of the interesting work he does internationally in the rule of law development in over 15 countries. He has, uh, here he has helped in many different projects from reforming legal systems to training judges to help develop proper criminal court procedures. Such projects have taken him to Central Asia, like Uzbekistan, Georgia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and to many former communist states, such as uh, Bulgaria, Hungary, Georgia, Moldova, to name a few. Another interesting area of his work involves developing legal systems to provide fair trials for terrorism cases. And this work has also taken him to Middle East and South Asia. Now, many of us in international relations tend to criticize United States for violating law. But today, when we hear Judge talk about his work, we will also be able to appreciate the uh, US government's support for development of rule of law in so many new countries. We are indeed very honored to have Judge Dunheim share his experience with us. Please join me in welcoming Judge Dunheim. Well, thank you very much, and it's good to be with you tonight. Um, I've been, I, I will have to admit to most of the time, most of my trips to the campus here at St. John's uh, were, have been to watch uh, football games between Concordia and St. John's. I seem to recall more losses than wins for my covers over the years, but that's a different point. I won't dwell on that tonight, uh, but I'm glad to be here tonight. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the rule of law development work that I've been doing for many years around the world. I do have a day job as a federal district court judge, soon to be the chief judge of our district, so uh, I'm probably going to have to stay home a little bit more often there, but I do enjoy doing this work, and because of communications today, which have changed dramatically from when I started doing this work, and I'll tell you a little story about that later, 
uh, I can do a lot of this work and maintain my fairly busy caseload from wherever I'm at. Um, I thought I'd just list the, some of the types of work. I'm not going to talk about each of these in great detail, uh, but I wanted you to know the kinds of work that I've done over the years. I've worked on constitutional development in a number of different places, which is a, a very, very interesting process. A constitution, of course, is the fundamental foundational legal document in any society, and it's a real challenge to put together a constitution that has broad public support, but also uh, can set uh, a foundation for the development of the rule of law. I've worked on a lot of legal system reform issues, which I probably enjoy next to constitutional work, I enjoy the most. Uh, sitting down with uh, Ministry of Justice people or uh, policy makers in a parliament and focusing on how, for example, to change a criminal procedure code to make it more fair to give uh, criminal defendants the kinds of rights that they are due under international documents that uh, the country that I'm in uh, has, uh, has agreed to. A lot of that work involves figuring out how to make judges more independent, um, both structurally and decisionally. It's not hard to imagine that it's a problem in many areas of the world where judges don't feel that they can be independent, that they fear losing their job if they rule in a case against a government or find someone to be not guilty of a crime. Um, strengthening rights of criminal defendants is, uh, is an important uh, step that many countries need to take and they're working on taking that step and also working on human rights and fairness issues. Another uh, type of work that I've done is working with judges in a mentoring relationship. These are mostly younger judges in former communist countries. I enjoy that work a lot. And also working on judicial ethics issues. A lot of countries have not yet developed judicial codes of ethics. And that's really essential because that's the responsibility part of uh, the judicial independence that judges need to have. Uh, training judges, training prosecutors, training criminal defense lawyers. I've done a lot of training programs. I, I, I rather enjoy doing them, but I probably don't do as much today. I focus a little bit more on reform efforts and mentoring efforts, but, uh, but the training is always, always interesting. It's, it's really fun to go to a country that does not have much of an adversarial system like we have, teach them the principles of an adversarial system, and then have them go to work on a mock trial. It is really interesting, and most actually do very, very well uh, in, that, in that setting. I've done a lot of different assessments of uh, judiciaries or legal systems, and that's kind of a separate area. Usually results in a lot of trips to focus on various needs of a country and then writing a judicial assessment uh, document in the end that they can use to make changes in their system. Uh, I do a lot of work on elections-related issues. I, in my former days as a deputy attorney general for the state, I represented the secretary of state in all elections disputes, so I enjoy elections law. So I've done work uh, mostly in the complaint resolution side of elections. And then uh, uh, it was mentioned that I, I work on helping countries build counterterrorism capacities and that's mainly working with the legal systems to make sure that they provide uh, a fair trial for people who are accused of terrorism. And most all of my work is funded originally by the State Department. It might go through different organizations, uh, but essentially I'm a volunteer in this work. I'm not one of those uh, paid consultants. And just a few words about why, the, uh, why this has developed so much in the last 20 years, this interest in building uh, the rule of law around the world. I think we have uh, so many uh, emer still emerging democracies around the world that for many, in many respects don't really know how to do it. They haven't had any experience uh, with developing a fair rule of law system. And I will tell you that I will never go into a place and tell them that you should do something this way because this is how we do it in the United States. I've never said that and I never will. 
Every country has to do it their own way, uh, based on history, traditions, cultures, but also based on world understandings of what uh, rights individuals have, uh, human rights that are basic throughout the world. There's a great curiosity about how we do things in America, and I get questions all the time. People want to know. I spent uh, a week with a wonderful group of judges in Tunis in December, in Tunisia, and at the end of the day, I'd say, okay, now it's your turn. We've talked about all these important subjects, and we've talked about problems and obstacles and how we can overcome them. Uh, what do you want to talk about? And the first day, they all, all almost in, in unison said, Ferguson. <laughs> so they're all very interested in what happens and follow what happens in the United States. I've had to, um, I don't defend, but I try to explain our use of the death penalty uh, because people always ask about that. Um, in a, uh, it, it was particularly sad to sit in a meeting one time with the president of Uzbekistan and with our ambassador and to have him look at us and say, well, how many people have you killed, executed in your country this year? You know that we've abolished the death penalty in Uzbekistan. And, uh, you know, the ambassador said, well, uh, you're right, but I think I'll have my colleague here answer that question. And so it was handed over to, to me to try to explain uh, that. And most every person around the world can also say the word Guantanamo. So I have, get a lot of questions about that. But I think it is important uh, to recognize that countries have their own cultures and their own uh, unique ways of looking at issues. And, and our way works well here. Well, for the most part, works well. Uh, but it may not work well in another country. So I, I will never tell someone to do what America does. I do think today there's a heightened... Uh, international consensus concerning fundamental legal and human rights. I think that's uh, uh, something that the world has focused on in the last 25 years, um, particularly in the, uh, earlier in the years following World War II and the development of the UN Covenant on Human Rights, or the International Covenant on Human Rights, and, uh, and the other uh, fundamental international documents. And countries want to know how they can comply with documents that they've signed. Globalization is another reason. Um, it's a small world today. Uh, business and law practices are, are global. And if you practice law in Minneapolis or you work for a corporation in Minneapolis, you better know how the rest of the world operates because it has an impact on how you do your work. And I think uh, there is a fairly focused desire among many to create a more of a level playing field through the rule of law. Uh, if you want to uh, build a facility in somewhere in Eastern Europe, you want to make sure that the country in which you're building your facility uh, has uh, sufficient uh, protections in place so you can protect your investment. And so you're interested in that country developing the rule of law and having fair judges and independent judges that don't have and they aren't controlled by the government. And then the final reason, I think, is the uh, almost unbelievable advances in communications. Uh, this was unimaginable two or three decades ago. It uh, results really in an almost instantaneous understanding of problems in all corners of the world. You can't hide really anymore an ability to participate in debate and drafting and working with countries from a long distance away, which was never possible before. Just a quick example, I, I did a lot of work in, in the 19, early 1990s in Russia when they were first uh, uh, a newly independent country when the Soviet Union fell. And I had uh, a case, this is right after I became a judge, I had a case that involved an emergency hearing I had to have. It's fine. I got on the telephone in my hotel room in St. Petersburg, and I um, they had about an hour-long hearing. The lawyers were in my courtroom. It all worked very well. I was quite satisfied. I hung up the phone, and about a minute later, there's a knock at my door, and there's a guard at the door uh, who didn't speak English, of course, and he was. it was clear he wanted me to come with him right away. And so I did. I followed him downstairs. We went to the uh, office of the telephone lady, 
and I was, I w it was clear to me that I was being told that I had to pay them $800 for that phone call before I would be allowed to leave the hotel. And I said, well, I don't have $800. And well, they would show me where the nearest ATM was, and, but they were, they were determined they were going to have their money before I left. You know, today, I can do that call on Skype for nothing. And uh, it's amazing how things have changed. Someone can send me a document from halfway across the world by email. I can spend a day working on it, making suggested changes, email it back. And it's part of the debate on perhaps a reform of a criminal procedure code. So things have changed a lot. And I think that's one of the reasons why we're so interested in uh, making these changes around the world. Well, let me go through a number of different places that I've been. I won't talk too long because I want to make sure I have time to answer questions that you have. I mentioned Russia because that's really where I started doing this work. I was fortunate enough uh, to be selected as a young political leader delegate uh, to the Soviet Union back in 1991. Our trip was delayed and delayed, and finally we went uh, in December, which happened to be the month that the Soviet Union ended. So I was there at the end of that, um, that empire uh, and watched everything completely fall apart. It was so incredibly fascinating that I just got hooked on working uh, with people in foreign countries. I saw these individuals. Uh, uh, Russians who were so interested in creating a new system, to getting away from that old, horrible system that they had and creating a democratic system. And so I helped with that. The American Bar Association started a program right away when the Soviet Union ended. It exists today as the Rule of Law Initiative, and I was an early volunteer for that. I did a lot of different reform efforts and programs in Russia when they were really interested in our help. That, of course, has changed. Uh, they're not much interested in our help today, as you probably imagine. Uh, but things can change and, and go back. Um, part of the reason I started doing this work and, was, and did so much of it is because I was available and I would go. Uh, I think I was the only judge who would agree to go to um, a place called Omsk in Siberia in the middle of January to do a, a week-long seminar. Uh, and it was cold, and <laughs> it was a place where when the, um, the airplane was landing, uh, it looked like we were landing in this huge snowdrift, and they explained, well, they get so much snow there, they just, they don't, they just pack the runways. They don't, they don't clear them. Kind of like the roads back in my hometown when I was young. They never really plowed them. They just packed them down, and, uh, and that was the same, but it was a... Uh, judges from all over Siberia had so much fun with, with that particular seminar, even though it was, was really cold. The place I've been to the most is Kosovo. Uh, again, my willingness to go almost anywhere uh, resulted in me getting asked to go there uh, late in 1999, not long after the NATO bombing campaign had ended. The UN had taken over administrative control of Kosovo, which technically was still a province of Yugoslavia and under Serbian control. Uh, but the UN was controlling it, and they appointed all these former judges to be judges again and said, go to work, and nothing happened. So I was asked if I would come and uh, help them figure out how to restart a legal system, which was a, quite an interesting adventure for about a month. Uh, with a small group, I traveled everywhere in Kosovo, visited all the courthouses, had an engineer with me who would crawl around the basement to see where the pipes had to be reconnected. And I focused on the legal system, which within six months we had going with uh, substantial donations coming from the U.S. and from, uh, from Europe. And so that started many years of working in Kosovo. Uh, judicial assessment missions, uh, reform of the criminal code uh, and the criminal procedure code, uh, other types of legal work, even on the commercial side, and then eventually uh, working on their constitution. And I, uh, I worked my way into being really the principal outside advisor to the process that developed the constitution of Kosovo in 2007 into 2008. A very interesting process. and. Uh, I can spend a little time talking about that. 
um, it was um, it was interesting because it was okay get them a constitution the American ambassador looked at me and said get it done I don't know how you do it but just get it done and um, you know writing a constitution is is interesting uh, you really need to have a local commission you need to have local uh, input we were hamstrung because this was a surreptitious effort being done because Serbia was still technically in charge of Kosovo and they were objecting to any kind of move toward independence. Uh, getting all the ethnic min minorities working with the majority pop Albanian population was a real challenge. But uh, in the end, um, we had a constitution ready within about eight months. I, I did a lot of briefing, a lot of memos for them to help them uh, weigh the various decisions I wanted them to make. In the end, much of what they had drafted had to be rewritten, uh, which I did. Uh, some long days in the fall of simply rewriting everything, but keeping the decisions that they made that they wanted in their constitution. And it was ready for publication about an hour after they declared independence in February of 2009. There was a brief period of public input, and it was in force in June. So about. Uh, 14 months after I started the process, the Constitution was in force, and by all accounts, it's working uh, pretty well still. In recent years, I've been working with the Constitutional Court in Kosovo, and that's been uh, interesting as well. Uh, I've worked in most of the countries in the Balkans, which is a unique region. It sometimes reminds me of being on the Iron Range in Minnesota, where so many people are descendants of immigrants from the Balkan region. Uh, but uh, in virtually all of the former countries of the former Yugoslavia, I think all seven of them, I've done various projects from Macedonia in the south up to Slovenia in the north. And it's an interesting region, and it's an interesting uh, set of challenges for these relatively small areas which have become countries after the breakup of Yugoslavia. All of them face a lot of the same issues. In Kosovo right now, one of the biggest problems is corruption. And it's not because there aren't laws prohibiting this. There are very strict laws. But you, we haven't reached the point in Kosovo yet where the judiciary and the prosecutorial system really has the courage to step out and prosecute government leaders who are uh, really engaging in a pretty serious form of corruption. Um, Hopefully that will change at some point soon, but that's a problem that many developing countries face. Many have anti-corruption commissions. Uh, many have uh, special <coughs> international prosecutors to come in to look at these questions. It is a tough, tough challenge to get beyond that. I think so many, so many people, once they get into a position of power, they have good intentions, but they think, well, I watched when previous leaders of this country uh, stole us blind, and now, you know, I deserve it. It's my turn. And I think there's a, too much thinking like that, not only in Kosovo, but in other places around the world. Uh, I want to mention uh, the country of Uzbekistan, which I've, I've been to about 20 times. I think I've set some kind of record for how many times I've gone to Uzbekistan. It's in Central Asia. Uh, it's not a country that too many people visit because it's a little difficult to get visas to go there. It's a, it's a beautiful country. It has these ancient cities that were on the Silk Road and the most important and wealthy cities in the world uh, back five or six centuries ago before they discovered how to build ships that could uh, go around to uh, the uh, Asian part of the world and, and haul goods and trades and not have to go through this land route across to Asia. And they're beautiful places, and it's a place everyone should, should visit to see these uh, old, massive structures that still exist today. Uzbekistan is a dictatorship, no question about that. They've had a lot of human rights issues in the past, a lot of real problems. Many would argue the problems still remain. I mean, I've been able to work there and build trust with a lot of government officials because I don't feel like it's my job to condemn them for things like that. There are organizations like Human Rights Watch, 
uh, and other uh, NGOs that do a good job of criticizing them over human rights issues. My job is to give them suggestions on how they can make their system better, how they can get beyond the kind of criticism that they're facing uh, day in and day out. And so in Uzbekistan, we've worked on a lot of different projects. Uh, I'm not sure how much more independent the judges are. We're working on various things. Judges have five-year terms there. Um, I've gotten them to change their criteria for reappointment of judges. One of the criteria before was how many times they were appealed by a prosecutor. That was a negative thing. If you had more than one or two times a prosecutor appealed your decision, you probably weren't going to be reappointed. Obviously a significant threat to judicial independence, which uh, is something that uh, you know we really need to have in these countries to, to bring in uh, investment. Uh, but I like to go back to places many times, uh, like I've done in Uzbekistan, because then you start getting to know people and they trust you after a while. The worst thing I can do is go into a country once and do some training and leave and never come back. I generally will refuse any assignment like that. I want to go in, I want to get to know people, I want to look for reformers. When I first started in Uzbekistan in 2001, which was more in the dark ages for that country, uh, we were working on a, a, a project for the State Department for the democracy uh, Human Rights and Labor uh, Bureau of the State Department to find uh, the, uh, the reformers inside the system to help them understand human rights issues, to focus on trying to give them the ability to change the system from within. No one was able to change that system from the outside. They were, you, you could criticize them day in and day out. They just shut their ears and close their doors. It just doesn't do any good. Uh, they're used to getting criticism, they don't care. But if you get people inside who really understand and want to change the system, and that's really uh, been, I think, very fruitful over the course of the years to see some of the changes that they've come up with themselves, things that I might have talked to them about five years ago. And then I get back and then someone says, can you meet with me? I want, want to show you what we enacted last year. And it's a whole set of reforms, a lot of issues of which we discussed at great length years before, and I had hopes, but nothing uh, had ever happened up until then. It's interesting because you find the reformers, and it's, it's a little bit of a, a dance, you know. It's, uh, you have to be a little bit careful. You don't want to be talking to someone who really is not a reformer and who just wants to know uh, what you're telling people. And getting yourself in trouble, uh, but you can, you can find the reformers. It's an instinctual thing, but when you find them, you give them all kinds of ammunition. And then sometimes when you go back, and I found this over the years, uh, and I call them or email, can we meet? And I meet with them with like 20 people around a table. And I think, uh-oh, <laughs> things are not going well right now. There is uh, half of these people are intelligence agents, and uh, we're not going to talk about legal system reforms. But about half the time, they'll meet you for coffee at some local place, and you can talk freely, and you know that you're making some difference there. These projects are, you know, small. You look for small baby steps. You have to have a lot of patience because it takes a long time to make changes in places like Uzbekistan, even longer in the neighboring country of Turkmenistan, which is really, really backward, although they've got people who are interested in making changes. Every system has reformers, uh, people who have read about what the rest of the world does, that are kind of embarrassed about how behind their country is, and they want to be able to make changes, but they can't, you can't push them too hard. Uh, so that's really what I've done in Uzbekistan. Um, I helped them develop a, a, a code of ethics for their judges, which is very, very good. Now they have to figure out how to uh, implement it. That's their great problem. I tell them, you know, you're really good at passing legislation quickly. It's good legislation, but you're not very good at the implementation side of it because not too many judges or prosecutors or people know about changes in the law. So we're working on implementation now uh, in Uzbekistan and some of the neighboring countries. Uh, uh, I was supposed to go to Kyrgyzstan in a couple of weeks. I've been doing ongoing work there, but I, I have a 
conflict, so I couldn't go, so I recruited another judge to go in, in my stead. Uh, I like those countries. They're all, all five of them are former Soviet republics. They're all a little bit different. Um, and you find these gems like in Uzbekistan, in far western Uzbekistan, an autonomous province that's called Karakalpakstan, uh, which is out near the greatly diminished Aral Sea, which is an environmental disaster. The Soviets reversed rivers flowing into it, and as a result, it's this huge sea that's shrinking. You see massive ships just sitting out in the middle of the desert, salt and sand blowing around. It's really terrible. In the middle of this is this uh, huge town called Nukus, which not too many people know about, N-U-K-U-S. And I went there, and it was, you know, it, it feels like you're going back 40 years. There isn't a new car in the place. There's one hotel in the entire city of half a million people. You know, very few restaurants. It's a very, very poor place. And we were working with the judges and prosecutors from the area. And then right in the middle, they said, you should go to our museum. It's kind of a nice museum. So, okay, we'll go to the museum. You walk in in this fantastic museum. It's known locally as the Savitsky, after the name of the person who collected all the forbidden art of the Soviet Union. Anything that was supposed to be destroyed or hidden away, he just bought it up for little or nothing and hauled it across the steppes and deserts out to western Uzbekistan. And starting with Stalin and uh, Soviet leaders in the years after that, <laughs> Nukus, no one wants to go to Nukus. It was okay. And it's a fabulous collection. There's a documentary on it called The Desert of Forbidden Art that's really quite good. Uh, you can probably find it on Netflix. And it's this great little museum that all the museums of the world just can't wait to get their hands on their collections. So they'll send a collection out for a little while to the Louvre or they'll, to the museums in the United States. And it's just it's wonderful stuff. And you just find these little gems in these places and what's interesting about this kind of work. I have this group of uh, judges from Eastern Europe. There's about 40 of them uh, the, from the countries of Eastern Europe that I get together with once or twice a year through uh, an institute in Prague. And I enjoy working with them. I'm going back. I'm going to meet with them the first week in June for three days. And we just talk about issues that they're facing. And it is just, it's a delight. I mean, it's, it's so easy to be a moderator for this group. I will throw out a question, and then like three hours later, I say, well, that was a good discussion. I really had, didn't do much to moderate it because they're so good and, and, uh, and so interesting. And they come from all the countries of Eastern Europe. So I like that process a lot. And I think it's good for judges in those countries to get together, to talk about the issues they face. There's a lot of common issues. And they're common issues that we face here in the United States as well. And my job is just to kind of keep the conversation going. And they've all become really good friends. I've spent a considerable amount of time in, in Ukraine, which, of course, has been in the news of late. Um, I helped with a criminal justice reform project uh, several years ago and then also uh, was working on a constitutional reform project that obviously uh, didn't fall apart. It just got put on the back burner when the difficulties came a couple of years ago. And we're really waiting to start up that project again. Uh, con uh, Ukraine needs a new constitution. There's no question about that one that uh, will uh, implement some of the federalism concepts that we find in our system here and in other places where you need to give some level of autonomy to local areas. Uh, it was interesting in Ukraine because I could get everybody to agree exactly on the substance, which is rarely the case. I mean, they would agree on the substance, but then they wouldn't agree to agree with the other political institutions or entities. Well, if that party supports this, we won't support it. Uh, or if that party uh, wants this change, I won't agree to that change. So it was almost impossible. You could see that something was going to happen before too long because they were just... They were ready to have bare-knuckle fights among the various political parties. Um, it, was a, it was a great project while it lasted. I hope we can get back to it. Uh, this, I don't think conditions are such right now that are conducive to going back to Constitution writing, but it has to be done relatively soon. The problem in Ukraine is that you know, Western Ukraine is 
really a European country at heart. I mean, it still has aspects of the old Austro-Hungarian Empire, which was a big part of Western Ukraine. Eastern Ukraine is, you know, for all practical purposes, Russia. And no one was had any great surprise that the Russians wanted the Crimea back. Uh, the Crimean War of in 1850s, 1854, is, is legendary in every Russian's mind. So this is a tough problem, but I think it can be, uh, it can be worked out, you know, through uh, the rule of law, through constitutions, as opposed to through fighting. Uh, so, interesting work in Ukraine. Um, the counterterrorism work that I've been doing is in South Asia. Uh, the UN asked if I would help the eight South Asian countries uh, work on their systems to improve their performance in handling uh, counter uh, terrorism trials. Uh, so many of them, the answer was simply to arrest whoever they thought they wanted to arrest, whether they were really guilty of anything or not and put them in uh, detention, uh, probably torture them for a while, and then have a quick conviction. And then, uh, depending on the country, they either go to prison or they get executed. And so um, from Afghanistan and Pakistan in the north on down to Sri Lanka and Bangladesh and Nepal and the Maldives, India, all those countries have been part of this effort. And I think we've made some progress to improving uh, Nepal especially, we've made a lot of changes there that uh, have been very beneficial. I've enjoyed working in Pakistan. It's a very interesting country. I'll mention a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, but this is working on all aspects of the system, from security of judges and security of courthouses to implementing legal rights for uh, people who are accused of terrorism. Uh, so a very interesting project that uh, has been going on for about three years now and has another year or two to run. Uh, I mentioned Pakistan. Um, we were talking about Pakistan earlier. Pakistan is uh, a country that is, is quite interesting. It, it has this unique feature in that it's got a really strong high level of its judiciary. Unlike the other countries in the region, I think closest probably to India, uh, but the other countries in the Asian region do not have strong judiciaries at all. And the Supreme Court in Pakistan is a very strong court and with very good uh, judges. And a lot of the uh, uh, kind of the top level of lawyers are very strong there too. It's, a, it's an interesting uh, uh, difference from these other countries, all of whom uh, have the British uh, traditions. Uh, and... Um, so we've been working fairly closely with Pakistan, not only on terrorism issues, which they need a lot of help with. They have anti-terrorism courts, and they rotate judges through them. They don't train them well enough. They don't have facilities for them. They put too many cases into the terrorism courts, uh, and these judges are overloaded. And I've talked to some of them. Well, I just had trial in my living room because there was no courtroom for me to use. Uh, and you can imagine... Uh, trying someone accused of something related to terrorism in your living room, in your house. I mean, that's just, uh, they, they need to make uh, some changes there, and they're, they're working on it. They have a pretty good judicial training academy that I've worked with. Um, elections work, I mentioned that. Those are, that's kind of interesting. It's a little different than rule of law development. Elections, of course, are a very important part of democratic society and development of democratic institutions. Uh, and they're, in many countries, they are subject to a lot of corruption and, uh, you know, influence, undue influence. You know, of course, Uzbekistan, the president won re-election last week with 90.54% of the vote. And, I just, you know, it's sort of interesting. Um, most of the opponents uh, spent uh, the week before the election in jail. That seems to be the way it goes, because it's a crime to say something negative about the president. They say something negative about the president, and they get put in jail, and they get 1% or 2% of the vote. Um, but, uh, but other countries are developing their elections. I hope to go in July to Myanmar, where they are developing elections, really popular elections for the first time. And... Uh, I'm going to focus on election complaint mechanisms, how to resolve election complaints fairly. And so I'm looking forward to that. Um, uh, Bangladesh, I've worked there on elections, and that's a, a country that is 
incredible in terms of its, you know, it's, it's the size of about a third of Minnesota, and it has 160 million people. I mean, it's just, it's incredible, uh, the overcrowding there. It's just, it's almost unfathomable uh, to be in Dhaka, where any given day there's between 14 and 18 million people, and no one really knows for sure. Um, but uh, uh, the election reform there has stalled. The two major political parties are really at their throats, and nothing's happening there. In Georgia, I've spent a lot of time working there as well, the country of Georgia, uh, which is uh, for a long time was very reform-minded. A we actually worked together with them to develop a jury trial system for certain kinds of criminal cases. Um, and I mentioned a story earlier about uh, a project that I was involved in, and that was uh, helping prepare the people for jury trials with a television program uh, that became very, very popular. It was called The Verdict. Uh, it was it aired, I believe, on Sunday nights, and uh, the first half hour was selected courtroom-related uh, scenes with a real jury, uh, students mostly, and uh, actors for a lot of the positions except the judge. And then the last half hour was the jury deliberating on the verdict and uh, became very, very popular and helped pave the way, really, for the development of a jury trial system there. They've cut back a little bit on it now with a new government, but uh, I think the people, their experience with the jury trial system was very good. Russia developed jury trials, so that influences all those countries in the region. Kyrgyzstan is developing jury trials this year, and most countries have an interest. Uzbekistan even has an interest. They've asked about it. They're curious about it. They have no idea how a jury system works, but they're uh, looking into it. And then finally, I wanted to mention the Middle East, uh, because I've done some work there. I mentioned that I was in Tunis, uh, and I've done work in the Emirates and uh, in several other of the, of the countries. Most of the work in the Middle East is pretty much on hold right now with everything that's going on there, unfortunately. Uh, Tunisia was really the one bright spot until the, 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 uh, the terrorist acts of several weeks ago at the museum, a museum that I had spent a lovely half day in when I was there in December. A lot of tourists were killed. Uh, so that's, uh, that's, that's, they thought that they didn't have terrorists, and obviously they do. So it's just a difficult place to work. Many programs in Egypt keep getting put on hold, uh, do it later, um, and hopefully uh, things will change before too long. I've trained Iraqi judges, not in Iraq, but uh, in places outside of the country, uh, good people, uh, really anxious to do good work. Um, so uh, in closing, I wanted to uh, just spend just a couple of minutes uh, at the challenges involved in writing constitutions, because I think this is an interesting topic, uh, because the, the constitutions are such an important uh, feature of uh, any government, uh, the foundation for really the rule of law. Um, so I, I, there's a series of questions I think one asks if you're asked to help develop a constitution, and you know it might be a good project as a student to work on something like this, at least from afar, uh, as a practice. Uh, who writes the constitution? That's a very important question. Who's going to be the decision makers for this? Um, the tendency is to defer to elected leaders, the politicians which I think is a very, very bad idea. Most politicians, unless you're really comfortable and safe in your seat, are not going to look too much beyond the next election. You know, they're very kind of short-term focus. And if they can put something in a constitution that will help them re re get reelected or help their party retain control, they're going to do it. So... Uh, I think political leadership needs to be consulted because they're representatives of the people, but it really is the rare politician who looks beyond his or her next election. Uh, so I think a consti good constitution writer should be looking 30 or 40 years out as a country develops and builds. And so uh, 
what is good for the future development of the country, I think, is the most important point, uh, much more primary than who wins the next election. So you look for people, wise people, probably lawyers, uh, uh, who have been around for a while, um, senior people, wise, experienced, moderate, former leaders perhaps, uh, with a wide variety of backgrounds, and I would also include brilliant young people. Every country has brilliant young people, and I spend a lot of time convincing them, trying to convince them to stay, that the future is in their hands, and don't get discouraged. Yeah, you see politicians that are stealing money from the government, and things get very frustrating after a while, but stay, because in the future, uh, you can you know, run this country the right way. Ethnic and gender diversity are also really important. The second point on writing a constitution I want to mention is the need to blend the modern international uh, consensus on human rights with local, historical, and cultural needs. You can write a perfect constitution that has everything that the world wants to see in it, and it'll fail if it doesn't have any connection to the people, connection to what they are familiar with. That doesn't mean uh, taking a subject and going too far and violating international law. But there's a lot of leeway on some subjects in constitutions, and if you can, for example, implement some form of Sharia law in, uh, in dealing with domestic issues, for example. I think that's a good idea because they're accustomed to using that law in that, in that manner. Um, about 30% of a constitution in any country is already written because it, ha it embodies the international covenants that focus on human rights issues that everyone has agreed are important. But there's more human rights issues to address. You want to address the issue of same-sex marriage, for example, in a constitution to forestall a fight later on. I mean, that's not a fundamental right uh, uh, worldwide yet, but it's a right that many countries are talking about. So um, I think uh, the international human rights are, are really important to, to focus on. Uh, Thirdly, I think you need to achieve some level of public input into a constitution. You just can't decree something and have it done. South Africa is the best example here because they took about three years to achieve a lot of public input into the development of their modern constitution. Um, it's really, it's a document by which the people are giving rights, uh, are giving up rights so that a government can be formed and they can be ruled by a democratic government. So they need to have public input into what goes into the Constitution. Um, sometimes there's negative pressure. Um, religion typically will rear its ugly head uh, in the context of a Constitution, and all you want to do is preserve the right of everybody to practice whatever religion they believe in. Uh, but that sometimes gets to be a tough issue. One should anticipate all the issues and the disputes that are come up. Uh, an ideal constitution is predictive, I think, of what issues will, um, will be important. It doesn't leave important issues for future debates. Uh, you can criticize uh, Congress for that these days because they write laws and then they can't agree on something while well, they just kind of gloss over that and, well, we'll let the courts resolve that. You write a constitution, you really need to be precise and anticipate all the issues. Um, Looking at uh, language in a constitution from a mischievous point of view is a very good exercise. How can someone take this provision and really make a mess with it? How can someone use this provision improperly? And a roundtable discussion, uh, you know, how, to, how to use this among good lawyers is a really good exercise uh, when you're writing a constitution. You have to have a structure that works in good times and bad times and anticipation is key. You also need to create the foundation for a fair and impartial judiciary. Uh, that's really important. Structural independence so that you don't have the ability of an elected politician, political leader to control judicial decision making. Uh, accountability is necessary too, but control and political influ influence is not something that should be part of any country. Um, recognizing that corruption exists and being ready to have a structure to prosecute it 
and to punish it is important. Um, I think we had a good story. We have a good structure in Kosovo. It's just not being utilized because I think the judges and prosecutors are scared, frankly. And that's what happens in some places until the rule of law is really developed. Um, in many countries where you're writing a new constitution, they've just gone through a, a terrible period of war, perhaps genocide. Um, that needs to be recognized. And um, mainly it is just a deep understanding of what went on before. Uh, Post-crisis societies have to provide for prosecutions. Some want to provide for other forms of healing, truth commissions or something like that. That's a decision to be made locally, but you can't ignore what territories have gone through uh, in writing a constitution. Uh, bringing everybody to the table is also important. Ethnic minorities need to have a say and a role at the table. Uh, otherwise, they're going to feel the document is going to be used to uh, discriminate against them. I mentioned religion. In Kosovo, this was interesting because Kosovo lies at uh, kind of the fault line of you know, the Catholic Church in the West, the Orthodox uh, Church in the East, and the Muslims uh, just to the South. History's religious fault lines go right through that part of the Balkans, and you can understand some of the ancient uh, divisions. Uh, that has to be an undercurrent that has to be considered carefully. Uh, how is a constitution amended? You need to provide for that. Difficult to amend, easy to amend. These are questions to address. Economic development is important to think about. How can you write a document that re can really help a country develop its economic uh, institutions? Avoiding a, a, a concentration of powers. European countries aren't as, as uh, and other countries around the world aren't as keen to uh, checks and balances as we are. The parliamentary system doesn't have as many checks and balances. Uh, but some checks and balances in any system are, are really important. And Kosovo was dividing power between a president and a prime minister, which were tough negotiations. Uh, thinking of how emergency powers would have to be used is something you need to do in a constitution. And finally, just which I have had to say over and over, is to avoid the impulse to simply copy from someone else's constitution. Now, just because it's written in someone else's constitution doesn't mean it's a good idea. A lot of the Albanians in Kosovo wanted to copy the American constitution. No way. Don't do that. It's a document from the, the 18th century. It's written in 18th century language. It works here because we have constantly interpreted it over the years and given kind of a modern lifeblood to those old words. You don't have that here. You can't adopt language like that. That was a constitution written at a time of kings and serfs and slaves and a very, very different world. So don't copy anything. Co you know, talk about the principles that are there, but don't copy anything. So anyway, those are some of the issues that I think are important in uh, building constitutions wherever you are. Uh, it's a fun project um, and one that uh, I've really enjoyed working on. So I think I've probably talked long enough now. I've, I've got to, I think, around 45 minutes here, and maybe uh, we can do some questions uh, before we uh, wrap up for the evening. Any questions anyone has or anything that you'd like me to talk about that I haven't? Yes. Yeah, there's a reluctance uh, to, to move. Uh, I think it has to do with public opinion there in Pakistan, a reluctance to move on this person in any significant way. Um, 
In, in Pakistan, they're always concerned about, you know, political stability. Uh, governments, you know, have, over the years have been uh, taken out by the military on a regular basis. The military is strong. Uh, the judiciary would like to play a role in all of that. I just think the government itself is probably uh, weak enough that they don't want to create the public uh, wave of perhaps anti-government feeling by prosecuting this person. And I think they're probably talking about it probably every day, uh, but it's, it's strange because they profess to believe in the rule of law and this person uh, would, if the evidence is strong, which I think it is, I think I agree with you, he should be prosecuted. Yeah. What is it, what? What is it involved? Involved? Well, uh, we've had conferences where we bring in uh, judges from each of the countries. We talk about issues and problems. We've worked on a, what I would call here a bench book, a series of procedures to follow that are consistent with international law and local law and can be worked on and changed to fit each country's uh, interests. There's some training that goes on, so we're in some respect training the trainers. Um, ultimately, it's really providing the people who are part of these conferences with a pretty detailed toolkit. And if we can take it beyond that to the judicial and prosecutorial training uh, academies and police training academies as well, we're trying to do that. We've been able to do that in Nepal, and we're starting to do that in Pakistan. Uh, it's been harder to kind of get into the other countries to do that. But we have a good set of uh, basic uh, concepts that follow international law that uh, they have in their hands now to work on. So that's really what we're doing. Yeah. Uh, that's a good question. I mean, there's a lot of informal mentoring that goes on. I don't know that we have a lot of judges in the U.S. to do it, to do what I do, but some do. Um, pr I probably do more than most. Uh, but, you know, I try to spend time with judges wherever I'm at. Uh, it's not necessarily officially a mentoring role, but I treat it as such. Um, we talk about common problems and issues. Uh, judicial independence is probably the main topic. Uh, threats to judicial independence, uh, things that keep judges from doing their job well, uh, that they're scared of, afraid of. Usually it takes a few days of talking before you really get into the tough issues. Uh, sometimes it takes you know, a drink of something to get them to talk about some, some of the issues, and that's part of this as well. You, know, you want to get them to talk about it so that we can uh, help devise solutions and tell them how we've dealt with issues like that here or how they've dealt with issues like that in, in UK or in Germany or in Norway or wherever. Uh, but a lot of it has to do with judicial independence, judicial ethics issues, threats. Um, the, the ju like the judge in, in Kosovo who was really, um, uh, you know, after a lot of discussion, I mean, really, it came out that I mean, he handled a case in a particular way because, you know, a, probably an organized crime figure had come to visit him and just said, you know, we know you'll do what the right thing is. We know exactly where your 15-year-old son goes to school and when he goes home every day. And we know you'll do the right thing. I mean, no money is changing hands, but it's a threat. It impacts how judges do their cases. And well, how do you handle something like that when that happens? I mean, that's a, that's a frequent, not exactly that issue, but issues like that. You know, uh, cases that are controversial, where you know the government has a very strong interest and you know that they might, uh, the government might do something to affect your position. Uh, judges fear losing their jobs, their good jobs, and they don't want to lose jobs. They don't want to rock the boat. And... You know, sometimes as judges, we do have to rock the boat if something wrong has been done. So those are a lot of the issues. It's mainly just talking through them, uh, giving someone a, a, an ear, an experienced ear to listen to a lot of these issues. 
I don't hear anything that I, that's new. There are issues that have been dealt with in this country many times in earlier years probably were more advanced than these countries are, but they're, they're tough issues sometimes individually for people. So. Questions, anybody? Yeah. That's a really good question because you know I think I I always take I think I always take more from these sessions uh, than I give. I always feel that way because I learn a lot. Uh, you know, just having to explain, for example, why do you have you know plea bargains in America? Why do you do that? Why do you? Uh, are, how are you sure someone's guilty when they plead guilty? Uh, isn't aren't aren't you? Uh, putting people in jail and prison when they're not really guilty because they haven't been proven guilty. Just having to explain that in some detail to people to help them understand why we do what we do here in America helps me understand the system and actually helps me uh, perform my job uh, better. Just by, we get, we get into, you know, we have so many uh, changes of pleas to guilty pleas in our cases I might do six or seven a week. I mean, they get to be very routine. And to step back for a second and say, well, why do we do that? And how do we really make sure that someone is guilty? And I think I've become a better judge just understanding how others outside of our system look at what we do and, ha and answering their questions. Um, so uh, for me, it's really, uh, uh, it's helped me become a better judge, I think. Uh, and I enjoy the interaction, particularly with other judges, but I enjoy working with prosecutors and lawyers as well. I just, I always learn something from it, whether it's some unique insight that someone from another country has to a particular issue, or whether it's an insight I get to my job just based on my interactions with people. That's a very good question. So. Anybody, yes? Yeah, you have to you have to do it carefully because you hear that all the time. Well, we can't do that because that just is not the way uh, things are done in this country. For example, I mean, we we have to respect um, you know local traditions, and to a certain extent, you have to understand those local traditions and see if there's a way that you can preserve as much of it as possible, but still being entirely consistent with what I call the, the really the world understanding on basic human rights. And it's possible to glean that world understanding pretty clearly from uh, the, uh, the international documents, whether it's the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which are very, is, is very important for uh, developing uh, criminal justice systems around the world, uh, or the International Covenant on Human Rights, uh, decisions of the European Court on Human Rights, which are, are very interesting and helpful in a lot of countries. I mean, there's that basic set of uh, rules that we have really all agreed to follow, even though we as Americans don't follow a few of them, and you know, some countries don't follow a few of them as well. That It happens, but that's the basis for a lot of the training, a lot of the discussions. These countries have signed these documents. They have pledged to abide by them. Helping them understand that obligation is important. And 
helping them understand where a cultural issue, usually involving uh, how women are treated, um, sometimes others, but usually that's where a lot of these issues go, uh, making sure they understand how that conflicts with their responsibilities under international law is not an easy topic, and it really has to be approached carefully and over a, 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 lo a longer period of time. This is not a, an overnight thing. Uh, but, you know, they're smart people. They kind of figure it out after a while, after you talk through a lot of these issues. It's not an American issue. It's a world issue, and they want to be what part of the world community. They want economic development in their country. They want to be viewed as a country that recognizes human rights and protects human rights. There's a basic kind of uh, understanding that they, they want to get to there. And so that's the countervailing force to a local or cultural or historical practice that is very discriminatory. Uh, you know, a lot of countries, we haven't convinced them to uh, make many changes. Saudi Arabia is a very good example. Uh, I guess you know, we don't have, I've never done any work there, so I don't really know the, the challenges uh, in doing it there. Uh, but other countries, you know, Afghanistan is, has some difficult challenges there. So, yeah. Increasingly, more and more people are speaking English, um, even in Uzbekistan. In fact, you know, in elementary school, they're teaching English now instead of Russian, much to the chagrin of President Putin. Um, you know, it's, there's interpreters all the time for all of these projects and all of the conferences and all of the meetings. There's always interpreters. Uh, a lot of them are very, very good because they're paid a good salary uh, to, to do this. I mean, I always try to know uh, some words from a foreign language because it really is a great icebreaker, even if it's like 15 or 20 phrases and no more. And, you know, I, I don't really have time to learn Albanian. I don't have time to learn Uzbek, you know, all these different languages. Georgian, the alphabet is just like mind-boggling to me. Um, and I, I can't even begin to, to think about the, uh, the Asian languages. Uh, but interpreters are very good, and people are used to uh, working through interpreters. A lot of it's simultaneous, so you don't have to wait for someone to uh, interpret something. And by and large, it works pretty well. And you find a lot of people that do speak English where you can have a, a more of a private conversation with them. I haven't found it to be a problem. I wish I spoke more languages than I do, but you know, I, I, I make do. I just, it, you know, I, I'm not going to le learn Uzbek, even though it would be very, very helpful for me. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, that's a really good question. I think most of the world fo will follow a parliamentary system. Certainly in Europe, you have a parliamentary system. I mean, that's even if you wanted to create a system like the United States has in Europe, it just it's not going to work because it's the European way of doing things. And a lot of other countries uh, have have much of the same kind of system, uh, which is, of course, uh, less subject to checks and balances, although you have the ability to dissolve the parliament uh, when you don't have consensus on an issue. Um, you know, I think the parliamentary system works pretty well. I think you have to have some checks and balances. You need to, I mean, the judiciary is an important check uh, on any system, assuming that it is uh, independent enough and powerful enough to exercise that force. And that's where the biggest problem comes. The government gets to be so powerful, and if they have an ability to control judges or control the judiciary through a ministry of justice or something like that, that takes away the primary check. Um, I like, in the countries that I've worked on, I, I like to help develop a little bit of checks and balances between a president and a uh, prime minister. 
so not all the power is vested in the prime minister and the and the elected government but the president whether elected by the people or elected by the assembly has to be to a term of course has some powers to uh, exercise a little bit of control in certain areas um, you know, we put joint control over the intelligence services in Kosovo, for example, uh, so that uh, the president and the prime minister have to jointly agree on the, the head and deputy head of the intelligence service, and both have a right to get briefings on intelligence issues. That's one example of a way to create a little bit of a check. Um, you know, a president maybe appoint ambassadors, for example, um, and you have a wide range of different roles of a president around the world. You have a powerful president in France, and most people don't know who the prime minister is. In Germany, you know the chancellor who's a prime minister. Most people don't know who or care who the president is. So you have a wide range of different models to look at. But therein lies a little bit of uh, intra-executive branch checks and balances, which I think is a good thing up to a point. So... Uh, but uh, you know, looking at the Congress and the President and all that's happened in this country, I've I've had a probably a newfound respect for the parliamentary system, which which doesn't have to go through that uh, kind of uh, uh, nastiness that uh, that we have. So, any other questions anyone has? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, we wrote into the Constitution uh, in Kosovo an enormous amount of protection for minority rights. Um, any uh, discrimination issues can ultimately go to the Constitutional Court. Communities that are made up of ethnic minorities have a majority in that community, have special rights to bring matters directly to the Constitutional Court. Um, and so we tried to build in as much legal protection as we possibly could for uh, the there's six or seven uh, minority populations in Kosovo, including an Egyptian community uh, that has some of their own schools. Um, so I mean, the law the laws are there for people to be able to use to protect their rights. Uh, memories of the war are still. Uh, intense. Um, there's a lot of killing that went on there. People remember very, very well what happened. Uh, some of the Serbs, uh, ethnic minority Serbs in Kosovo, don't really want to be part of the Kosovo government or part of the, the, the country, period. They live there because they own property there and they want to be there, but they don't really want, they want to be separatists, they want to be, they want to listen to the Serbian prime minister, not the Kosovo prime minister. So that's a different problem, and they don't take advantage of the rights that they have. Uh, the, the, uh, we had ethnic thir Serb representatives on the Constitutional Commission. They participated sometimes. When they didn't, I would go talk to them and get their input into everything. So we really tried very hard. Um, it's very difficult. It just takes a while to get beyond uh, what, what happened in the 1990s. It's probably going to be two or three generations. Um, they're such, they come from such different places, and it's, um, it's very, very difficult. And, and Bosnia has, as some of you know, has a very difficult problem with the, the, uh, the tripartite structure that they put together there, which needs to be changed. And it badly needs to be changed, but there, no one really wants to dive into it and get back into the, the yelling and the shouting again. Anybody else have any final question? All right, well, thank you. I enjoyed being here with you tonight.